Welcome to our service today. My name's Ian Lewis and I'm one of the ministry team here at St Bart's in Bath. Each week we know that we're welcoming people from across the UK and from many parts of the world alongside members of our St Bart's congregations. And that is such a delight. So wherever you are and whoever you are, you are very, very welcome indeed. Although this is not how we want to meet together and we long for the day when we can be back in the same building at the same time together again, it is a real joy to have so many folk from across our congregations leading us as we meet with God through Jesus each week. Today, Matt and Claire are leading our music. The prayers are led by the Tinlings. Naomi is reading from Luke 16. And Tim will be explaining the next of Jesus' parables for us. Bev's cats have developed a, a real fan club over the last few weeks. So see if you can spot them when Bev is talking to our children and youth later. And we have two special videos on life in lockdown to help us to pray for one another during this challenging time. Our opening video of Psalm 95 reminded us that in God's hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it. His hands form dry land. God made this whole universe. He holds the oceans in his hands. He numbered every grain of sand. However uncertain life may feel at the moment, our God is still seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Let's sing together.
Lewis felt the nails upon his hands bearing all the guilt of sinful man. God eternal, humbled to the grave, Jesus, Saviour, risen now to reign. Behold our God, seated on his throne. As we look at our lives, we know that we are not what we should be. We've done wrong, we've rebelled against God, and we need his forgiveness in our lives. So at this point in our service, let's just be still and quiet for a few moments before we pray together. As we pray, the words will appear on the screen. Do pray with me if you feel able to do so. O Lord, we cry to you from the depths of our being. Let your ears be open as we plead for mercy. If you kept a record of our sins, none of us could stand before you, but you alone can forgive us. Therefore, we come to you in awe. Lord, we wait for you, and in your promise we put our hope through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Hear these words from the prophet Isaiah. The Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One, blots out your transgressions and remembers your sin no more. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have redeemed us through the death of your son, Jesus, on the cross. Thank you that through his resurrection, we have life. Help us to live for you this week and honour your name in our lives. Amen. In our service today, we're going to meet two households facing the challenges of living in lockdown. All of us are living in lockdown and have our own challenges. But these two households will help us to remember one another and pray for one another. First of all, the challenges of homeschooling. And then later in our service, the challenges of working from home. Hello, we are the Etheridge family. At the moment, like all children all over the country, Edward, Eva and I are learning from home because of lockdown. Do you like home learning or school best? Home learning. Home learning. School is great. <laughs> Here's the best. Here's the best. Teacher, mum or dad? Dad! Dad! Mum! Dad! Dad! I mean dad! <laughs> what subject do you like the most? Playing! Art! Building Lego! For those of you who don't know, the way home learning has been set up is different in each school. So there may be a weekly email or a work pack sent from the setting or just links added to the school websites. Then families are required to find the work set for their children and then present it however they think is appropriate. Home learning has raised quite a few struggles here. One main issue is how I share my time out. With three young children all doing different activities that mostly need adult help, this can be a trial. It's also hard for the other children to focus when they see a sibling playing a game or doing an activity with me and we've had more than one or two flare-ups. Our kids have adapted really well to being at home 24-7. They're having a blast but the one thing that they have said is that they are all missing their friends and their work buddies. They say that learning on their own is not as much fun or as easy as learning in a class at school. Please can you pray for the following prayer points. Our aim should always be to demonstrate to our children the grace and love of God, so we pray that you will give us strength to act and speak in a way that highlights that. The lasting lesson we want our children to remember from lockdown are the closeness and faithfulness of the Lord. 
We pray that God will help us remember this as we balance demands from schools, demands from our own jobs and demands from the children. When days don't go as we imagine, when the children respond in a different way than we would like, we pray that we will not react in anger, but that we will have the patience and wisdom to address these situations in a Christ-like way. Hello boys and girls, it's Bev here. Uh, wave to the TV if you're watching, do a big thumbs up if you can. Great to see you this morning. and. Uh, and so this morning, I'm going to tell you a little story and we're going to do a reconstruction of the event uh, based on a real event. But some names and items have been changed to protect people's identities. So, without further ado, here's little Bev. Be careful out there, young Bev. OK, Granny, I'll be careful. Uh-oh! What was that sound? Sounds like a CD case on the floor. Uh, it was, it was the cat. Jumped and broke it. Really? Why is it so hard to admit we're wrong? Why is it so hard to admit we've done wrong? Why is it so hard to confess our sins? That's what it means uh, to admit we've done wrong, is to uh, confess our sins. But why is it hard? Well, we're afraid of getting found out. We're afraid that if others find out what we've really done, what we're really like, the people will know just how much of a nincompoop we really are. And we're afraid that if God knows what we've done, he'll find out just how much a big of a sinner we are. But... Do you know what? God already knows all things. He already knows what we're like. He already knows what we've done. And so God already knows our sinful and selfish hearts and thoughts. But God still wants us to come to him and we don't need to hide from him. And this is what it says in the Bible. This is our verse for later. It says, if we confess our sins, that means if we own up, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So if we confess our sins to God, what happens? He forgives us. He forgives our sins. Isn't that great? And more than that, it says he purifies us from all unrighteousness. That's big words there. But what does it mean? It means he makes us clean and brings us back into friendship with him so we can be friends with God. And that's what it means when we own up to God, he forgives us and brings us back. Our friendship is restored. So let's go back to young Bev and see what she does. Uh, yeah, Granny, I did it. I knew it was wrong and I'm really sorry. I broke the CD case. Please forgive me. Of course, dear, you're forgiven. Come in and have a hug. OK, I'm coming. For some reason, I never got a clip of them hugging. Uh, right, well, let's say our God's Word says verse from the Bible, OK? Let's say together, it'll be on the screen, this brilliant verse. God's Word says, If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. Now we're going to sing a song and this song is about our great big God who forgives and it goes like this. Our God is a great big God and you've got to stretch out really wide. Our God is a great big God, our God is a great big God. And what does he do? He holds us in his hands. And then it says he's higher than a skyscraper, you've got to reach up really high. And he's deeper than a submarine, so you go like this. And he's wider than the universe, 
and beyond my wildest dreams. And he's known me and he's loved me since before the world began. And this is the fun part. How wonderful to be a part of God's amazing plan. And then you go around again. So let's sing with Owen. Richard Bullitt, I'm in the 1115 congregation. And I'm Emma Bullitt, but I'm also in the 1115 congregation. And uh, tell us kind of what, what do you do for a living and, and uh, what does that look like kind of uh, at the moment under lockdown? Sure, so I'm a civil engineer. I uh, work for a consultancy, so mate, typically mainly office based, designing bridges, stations kind of thing uh, in small teams. Um, now we're all working from home, um, which works fairly well. The internet is very useful, um, but, but there are challenges with, with doing that. And I am a piano and singing teacher, so I teach one-to-one, -one. I work from home. But at the moment I am mostly delivering my lessons online via the various video platforms. So at the moment, because singing teaching is a bit of a problem, I'm mostly teaching piano. And if I were to say to, to both of you, you know, what can we pray for you at this particular point in time? I think thanks that both of us have work that we can still be doing um, and ways to do that. Um, for me, I feel like there's more of a barrier to the people I work with. Um, so previously it was very kind of conversational. You could turn around and talk to someone very quickly. Um, and there was time to kind of speak at, uh, when you're making a cup of tea to kind of get to know people. That's kind of all gone. It feels like more of a barrier between people. There aren't the opportunities to, to chat and get to know people and build relationships. Um, and that's been a real challenge for me. Uh, online teaching, I think, has been a great blessing. I'm so thankful that I'm able to do that. But um, it's tiring and takes a lot of different energy and so I need to start looking like moving forward with what my business plan will look like for the next few weeks months kind of thing especially with social distancing um, I personally need to get myself to a point where I am I'm quite an anxious person so get myself to a comfortable point where I might be sort of 
willing with the right social distancing etc in place to be able to perhaps do a bit more face-to-face -face teaching but I just sort of need to look at what that looks like hi hello um, this morning we'll be praying about some of the ways that COVID-19 has affected human life recognizing that God is not only the sovereign ruler of the universe but is our father who is concerned with the details of our daily lives let's pray Father, we want to thank you for all those working in essential services during the COVID-19 crisis. For the NHS workers, for emergency services, and for those who do the things that we might normally take for granted, whether shopkeeping, delivering, cleaning, or collecting or recycling. Please give them strength, protection, and contentment in their work. Amen. Father, we thank you for our families around us. Please help us to love each other and get on well together. We pray for those who are vulnerable and on their own or feeling lonely. Please show them your love and may they find kindness from others. Amen. Father, we pray for teachers, parents and students as they homeschool and work out new ways of teaching and learning. We pray especially for the year sixes who may be sad about missing the usual end of term celebrations and for students who are coming to terms with the new arrangements for their GCSEs and A-levels. Please may they learn to trust you, even when things are uncertain or disappointing. Amen. Father, we pray for those whose work has become a heavy burden, and for those who are without work because of COVID-19. Father, we pray that in either situation they might look to you as the one who provides for our daily needs, and they might find their true value not in their work, but in their adoption as your children. And Father, we thank you for the amazing ways in which your grace comes to us in adversity. Please may we each be channels of that grace to each other and to those in need during this time of crisis. And we ask all these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close our time of prayer by saying together the prayer which Jesus taught and taught us to call him Father. Let's say together, our Father in, in heaven. heaven. Hallowed be your name, your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now we're going to sing our next song, I Will Glory in My Redeemer. And so we do this thinking of his sufficiency for us as our Heavenly Father. Let's sing.
Our reading today is from Luke chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. Luke chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, How much do you owe my master? 3,000 litres of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 1,500. Then he asked the second, And how much do you owe? 30 tonnes of wheat, he replied. He told him, Take your bill and make it 24. The master commended the dishonest manager because he'd acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray and ask God to help us to hear his word to us today. Let's pray. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Heavenly Father, shine the light of your word into our minds and hearts and wills, that we may walk well with you, for the good of others and ourselves, and to the glory of your name. Amen. If Jesus has paid the penalty for all my sins, including those that I'm going to commit in the future, that means that it doesn't matter what I do or how I behave. I know I'm going to be forgiven. All that matters is that I put my trust in him. Then I can live as I want. I vividly remember a year 13 boy in the youth group at the church where I was a curate saying just this to me. I imagine it was partly this that made the older brother so grumpy in the parable of the lost son. All these years I've been slaving for you, he said to his father, and now this son of yours comes home having squandered your property with prostitutes and you kill the fattened calf for him. If you're going to forgive everything like this, what's to stop us all behaving just how we want? It's a fair question. And it may well be that this is the reason that Jesus goes on to tell what the NIV calls the parable of the shrewd manager. Jesus knew that the wonder of God's readiness to forgive people's mistakes, whatever they may be, so freely and joyfully and completely, would provoke all sorts of questions like this. And so he goes straight on to address them. It's one of the stranger stories that Jesus told, but a big clue to its meaning 
comes when we realise that he tells it straight after the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin and the lost son. He hasn't finished. He's got more to say. There is a unity in all that Jesus says here, beginning from chapter 15, verse 1, with the Pharisees muttering about him, and going right through to chapter 16, verse 15, where these same Pharisees are now sneering at him. We can see a clue to this unity when we look at the two people in the two stories. The parable of the lost son is about someone who takes the wealth of another that shouldn't really belong to him and squanders it. The parable of the shrewd manager is about someone who takes the wealth of another that doesn't belong to him and chapter 16 verse 1 does what with it? Wastes it. Except in the Greek it's the same word. He squanders it. Two men who take someone else's wealth and squander it. In the first story, Jesus has the judgmental, self-righteous Pharisees in view, as he paints the most glorious picture of the compassionate, loving, father heart of God that leads him to delight to forgive. In the second story, Jesus now has his followers in view. Do you see that in verse 1? Jesus told his disciples. As now, he goes on to teach them what it means to live in relationship with such a God as this, knowing that he delights to forgive his children whatever they may do. Does it really mean that they can do whatever they want from now on because they know that God will forgive them. It might seem that way at first, because Jesus' story is about a dishonest manager. The manager was the man in charge of his master's affairs, responsible for all his business transactions. But he's dishonest, and he gets found out for squandering his master's possessions, and so he's called in and handed his P45. By the end of the week, he's going to be out of a job. But the manager isn't just dishonest, he's also sharp. And he quickly comes up with a plan in verse 4, and with no time to lose, puts it into action in verses 5 to 7. He reduces by significant amounts the outstanding bills of some of his master's customers, thereby winning their gratitude and favour, so that when in just a few days' time he's out on the streets, they will welcome him to come and stay as a guest in their homes. It's genius. And then comes the real shock in the story, the big surprise in verse 8. When his master finds out what the manager has done, he commends him. Not because he acted dishonestly, but because he acted shrewdly. There are various financial reasons which we won't stop on now to do with the way business was done in the culture of the time that might explain why the master wasn't just plain furious that the manager had ripped him off. But what Jesus wants his followers to see is that the master commended him for acting shrewdly, for being savvy, for making the system work in his favour. What the master was impressed by was that the manager saw calamity coming and took bold and decisive action to avert it. And in this, says Jesus, in the second half of verse 8, the people of this world have something to teach the followers of God. The people of this world, he says, are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. For the people of this world, there is a way of living in this world, a way of using worldly wealth, which will work to their advantage in this world. The manager in the story has just demonstrated how to do it. But Jesus isn't interested in helping people to make a fast buck in this world. Remember, he's talking to his followers, to the people of the light, to forgiven people, people whose true home 
is not in this world, but in the world to come. And to them, he is saying, for those who follow me, for the people of light, there is a way of living here in this world that will work to your advantage. Not in this world, but in the world that is to come. And he goes on to explain what he means in verse 9. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, when you die, you will be welcomed, not into their homes like the manager, but into eternal dwellings. Jesus is saying, that there is a way of living in this world, a way of using this world's resources that will have a direct and eternal effect on how we will experience the world to come. And what is this way of living? Is it really about being able to do whatever we want because we know that we've been forgiven? No. Someone who lives like that hasn't understood what it means to be forgiven. How much it cost God to be able to forgive us. As a truly forgiven person, it's about living wisely. It's about using all the resources you've been given in this world in ways that mean you will be welcome in the next world. Now, it's important that we hear this right. Jesus is not saying that we can change the Father's heart by what we do, that we can earn a place in heaven by what we do. There is nothing we can do to make the Father forgive us. Only he can do what is necessary to be able to forgive us. And he's done it in sending his Son into the world to die for us. No, we can't change the Father's heart by what we do. But as his children, we can warm the Father's heart by what we do. What Jesus is saying is that we can warm God's heart by using the possessions and resources we have in this world in ways that reflect the ways of the world to come. It's about using what you've been given to love and serve others so that they will welcome you into eternal dwellings. Let me give you an example. Years ago, when I was uh, vicar of Bath Ford, because I did some work in North India with Ian, uh, in Bath Ford we began to develop our own link with the Delhi Bible Institute. Now, there was a man in Bath Ford who was left a reasonable sum of money by a relative. It was more than £10,000. He wasn't particularly well off, that man, but he decided to give nearly all of it, £10,000 in fact, to DBI, to enable them to buy the land and the building, which is now the ashram at Lucknow. That was 13 years ago. Since then, and still today, pastors and evangelists and children's workers are being trained to take the good news of Jesus to the people of Lucknow and beyond. How many people will be in heaven one day because of how that man used his this-worldly wealth? Think of how many people will be waiting to welcome him into his eternal dwelling when he arrives in heaven. Imagine the expression that will be on Jesus's face on that day when he sees him face to face. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. And then in verses 10 to 12, Jesus reiterates what he has been saying, that the way we live in this world will have a direct effect on the way we experience heaven. In verse 10, he says, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted 
with much. The very little is the resources that we are given in this world. The much is all that we will be given in the world to come. Then in verse 11 he says, If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Worldly wealth is our resources in this life. True riches are all we will receive in the next. And then in verse 12, if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Someone else's property, that's the resources that belong to God, but that he entrusts to us in this world. Property of your own, that's the eternal inheritance that awaits us in heaven. There is a direct correlation between what we do with what we've been given in this life and how we will experience all we're going to be given in the life to come. If you were with us a few weeks ago, you may remember that this is exactly the same point that Jesus made in his teaching on the parable of the rich fool in Luke 12. Sell your possessions and give to the poor Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail. A direct correlation between what we do in this life and how we will experience the next. And he makes the same point even more clearly in the parable of the ten miners in Luke 19. A miner is a sum of money. And here, a master gives each of his servants one miner. When he comes back, one of the servants gives him back ten miners. And what does the master say? Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. Another of his servants gives him back five miners, and the master says, you take charge of five cities. A direct correlation between what we do in this life and how we will experience the next. Why does Jesus make the same point in three of his parables? I imagine it's because it's an important truth that he doesn't want us to miss. A truth that can transform the way we live our lives now and the joy we experience as we live them. And perhaps also it's because when we heard his teaching in Luke 12 a few weeks ago, some of us resolved to give to support the poorest in the world in the battle against COVID-19. But if you're like me, you may not have done anything about it yet. That is true of me. And perhaps God is giving us a reminder to act on what we decided to do. I want to finish by looking again at the unity we saw earlier that there is here in all Jesus is saying in these two stories, the story of the lost son and the story of the shrewd manager. If we look more closely at this unity, what we see is this. The father of the lost son is the God who is going to welcome his sons and daughters into eternal dwellings. And the point is this. If this God has a heart like the Father, who watches and runs and hugs and celebrates and welcomes home his wayward son, who has misused the resources that don't belong to him, well, just imagine what kind of a welcome he is going to give to those who use resources that don't belong to them in this way. To love and serve and support the poor and the vulnerable for whom Jesus has such a heart. And you know, it's more even than this. Because this God is a God who never changes. His heart never changes changes. This wasn't a one-off. 
He is constantly rejoicing and celebrating over his children every time we come to our senses and return to him, knowing that we deserve nothing from him. He is constantly delighted to forgive us, time after time after time after time. And if this is how God treats us when we get things wrong, just imagine how much he is rejoicing and celebrating in heaven, when by the power of the Holy Spirit who has come to live within each of his children because of Pentecost, we are moved to choose to use the resources we have in this world for the good of others, whether it be our money or our time or our energy or our gifts, whatever we have to offer, no matter how small or insignificant it may appear to us. What a joy, what an encouragement, what an incentive for those who will put their trust in Jesus' death for them and so know that they are forgiven, that they are children of the light today. What a joy, what an encouragement to know this cast iron certainty. That amidst all the uncertainties of these difficult days, when so often we find that we just don't know what to do, and guidance from government often seems unclear, and ambiguous, we can be absolutely sure that the way we use anything we have in this life is going to have a direct and eternal effect on the way we will experience our unending life in heaven. That whatever we do for others now, we will receive infinitely more from our Father's hand then when he sees us and runs and welcomes us home to our eternal dwelling. Let's pray. Jesus ends by saying to his followers, you cannot serve both God and money. Heavenly Father, Give us wisdom to see that using money only for our own, this worldly ends, is to serve money. Help us instead, we pray, to know the freedom of serving you by using our money and all that you give us for your kingdom purposes. Thank you that we can be forgiven only because of your Father heart of love. Help us now to live always and only in ways that reflect your heart of love to the world. Amen.
we come to the end of our service, but it is important that we keep meeting together, even if it's only by phone or online. So why not contact somebody outside your household to encourage them today? Many people have found meeting together online in fellowship groups a real encouragement. And if you're not in a group, uh, let me encourage you uh, to contact the church office this week and they'll help you to find a group that you can be a part of. And don't forget our hope conversation between Roger Carswell and Neil Todman on Wednesday evening this week. That's Wednesday this week at 8 p.m. Uh, full details are on our websites, especially on the hopeinitiative.co dot uk website as we finish our service let's pray together may the lord bless you and watch over you the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord look kindly on you and give you his peace amen